Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the podcast, The Joyful Frugalista, and now here's your host, Serena Bird. Hello, Frugalistas, and welcome. Today, I have a very special guest, and of course, all of my guests are very special, but my guest today is someone who first inspired my love of personal finance. So many of us have had an aha moment when it comes to money, and it, often it's from reading a book. For some of you, it might be The Joyful Frugalista. More recently, it's been Scott Pate's The Barefoot Investor or Canna Campbell's The $1,000 Money Project, or maybe it's reading Money Magazine. But the first ever personal finance book I read, and in fact, I've got it here, is got it. I've got it here, is Making Money Made <laughs> Simple by Noel Whitaker. And there's a story about this, Noel, because I had my first ever, other than working for my mother in her factory job, as a checkout chick at Franklin's supermarket, and I used my first earnings with that to go and buy a copy of your book, which I think is the best investment ever. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Now, I have to be honest and say I haven't implemented all of of your advice. My life has kind of Taking me on different turns, including going overseas, getting married, getting divorced. Don't always get out of bed super early like you recommend. <laughs> I don't recommend it. It's just what I do. My wife doesn't. <laughs> well, I'm more of a night house, so I struggle with that. But the basic that's principles fine. about that, compound that's fine. That's interest fine. That's fine. <laughs> has stuck with me. So let me tell some of my listeners who may not know as much about you as I do about you. So Noel is an international best-selling author finance and investment expert. He's a radio broadcaster, newspaper columnist. He's written over 23 best-selling books, which have achieved worldwide sales of more than 2 million copies. His writing reaches over 3 million people every week, including through his weekly newspaper column. Today, we're going to talk about his new book. So obviously, that was his original one, which has been revised and updated. And his new book, which is here, is Retirement Made Simple. And unsurprisingly, this is also a bestseller, as is his original book. Well, see, what happened was that all the people who became wealthy from the first book are now older and and they need retirement. (laughs) Because retirement is the most complex of all. It is indeed. And what, what does actually make retirement so complex? Well, A, it, it, it's the road to death, which, let's be honest. And that encompasses wills and estate planning and the fact that you or your partner, if you've got them, may get sick. You're into aged care, retirement villages. You're into, well, wills and powers of attorney, how long your money will last, the interplay between tax and send a week in superannuation. So it's a minefield. And everyone who's bought that book has learned something. Well, I've learned a lot already. And, you know, I thought I knew a lot already, but I've learned a lot already from reading about this. I think one of the big traps is as people age and live longer, one partner may die and they repartner, which is fine. That's becoming very common. So all of a sudden you've got a repartnered couple with their own sets of kids and they want to keep them, want to keep them separate, then one of those may go into a nursing home and need a re- refundable accommodation bond called a RAD. Now, one partner may pay that, not knowing that when the partner dies in the nursing home, the RAD must go to their estate. So you could lose half a million bucks out of your estate just by not knowing that. That's really interesting. And then I guess if you don't have good relationships um, necessarily with stepchildren or other things, yes. it can be very complex. And then there's parent, and, you know, at the moment houses are going up. We know it's a housing boom at the moment. People go guarantor for their kids and put their name on the title deed. Now, I had one recently. They, they went a half share for their daughter could get the home. The home was $400,000. Now, they're now 65 applying for the pension. Their share is now, with, because the home has doubled, their share is worth $400,000 and they can't get a pension because of too many assets. Now, if they transfer it to the daughter, they've got to wait five years for the pension and they also pay capital gains tax. So that decision to go on the title, I reckon, has cost them $300,000. Wow, and I guess they just didn't 
calculate um, that lack no, of... We'll just go on the title. We'll see. One of the basics is you get, get advice before you sign the documents. If you know what you were doing, you'd never go go and talk to your kids. Sorry, you would never go on the kids' title. Then. Well, actually, either. Both are problematic. And I guess we're in a slightly similar situation in that my husband, Neil, so second marriage once again, and his daughters are in the process of buying land and building houses. And yeah, so similar sorts of conversations we've been having at home as well. Oh, no. It's just so there's all sorts of things like that. Mm. But you don't go on the title deed of your kids' properties because you will then incur capital gains tax because they get the capital gains tax exemption. You don't. And that may well stop you getting an age pension. Very interesting. And I guess in this day and age, most people don't want to live together as well. So you want to have your own separate houses. I know. You I know. I know. So there you are. But these are just some of the tricks. There's tricks everywhere. Mm. So it does sound like it's very complex, but yet you do make it sound very simple. So can I ask one question around how much money should people have prepared? Is there, you know, a golden figure that people should have for for their retirement in order to live comfortably? The, the industry fights about it. I mean, ASPA publishes every quarter the average figures for, for, for different households. It depends on the people. I mean, if they read your book, they'll be spending a lot less money than people haven't <laughs> read your book. What I say in the book is do a budget now and then take out the things that would only happen to work, like maybe a second car, maybe union mm-hmm. fees, all sorts of things. So take out, take out your work expenses then try and formulate a budget for when you're retired. You know, you may drink wine, you may not. You may ride a bike. You may travel business class. You may go coach. But the big expenses really are travel and food. Mm. In, 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 the, the big difference are, are travel and food. If you start hopping onto business class fares to overseas and jumping on a boat cruise, that's 50 grand. At least. Well, it can be. We were looking at a cruise the other day that was, we're not going, by the way, which is uh, 150000 I think, for a worldwide cruise. Mm-hmm. So, know. yeah, it can be crazy. You only live once. Well, I got an email from a wine place today. They're having a special gourmet dinner, $999 a seat. Wow. Yeah, no way for me. That's just crazy stuff. But there'll be people buying, you know. Yeah, they will. There's always different. So there's no fixed rule as to how much how much you need, but also how long your money lasts depends on the rate of return you can achieve. I mean, if you've got a million bucks and want to spend sixty grand a year, if you get five percent, you're out of money at eighty four. Eight percent will it'll it'll last to ninety nine. So how much the return you get on your money is the major factor as to how much you need to invest while you're working and secondly, how long your money lasts. Well, thank you for that. And I understand you've got some great calculators on your website that can help people work some of this stuff out. They're the best in the country. Those calculators, I designed them to be simple. They're just great calculators. You've got the age pension and the deeming calculator. You've got the age pension charts. You've got retirement drawdown. You've got compounding. You've got loans. All simple. And I use them every day. But I write columns, I need those calculators. I think sometimes people have like almost wishful thinking, like I'll invest a lot of money in a big house and somehow I'll find the money for the repayments and the price will go up. And I think when you bring investments down to the dollars and actually track it, do the math, it really can change things in terms of your decisions. Well, property has a cost. That's why I prefer shares to investment property because shares normally do better the income's franked normally. There's no repairs, land tax, vacancy insurance. And if I suddenly want 10 grand out of, out of my investments, if I've got shares, I can sell 10 grand in one minute, but I can't sell the back steps of the investment property. So I need 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, 50,000 dollars out of, out of my investment property. I've got to sell the whole property and get a great big capital gains tax bill. Mm. See, my thing's always been that you build, 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 build in shares and keep doing that because the returns, most of the returns come from capital gains tax, which are not triggered till you sell. So you can spend 40 years building without paying any tax on that. Then when you suddenly reach 60, 65, 70, 
you can step up little bits and still not pay any capital gains tax because you stay under the limit. There's some great investment tips you've shared already. And I must say, I really relate to your property. In my first marriage, I w- we were very overweighted in property, and we still have a lot of property. Although oh, our- so have I, so have I. Now, our plan is to sell it down over the next couple of years. But quite coincidentally, I've had a week with a lot of tenant dramas, quite unexpectedly. It all was tenant dramas, <laughs> and, and the worst is is commercial property. I mean, you don't want to. The average investor, sh- sh- okay, if you must have property, go residential. Don't go shops and offices unless you really know what you're doing because you could have a five-year vacancy and you're still paying the rates of the land tax and the insurance. Mm. I've seen people in terrible trouble because all they had was vacant industrial property. But the commercial lease rates, when it's working, they seem very enticing. I have to admit that I've found myself looking at some of these opportunities and dreaming that maybe one day, you know, I'd have this sort of large investment. But I agree, you know, like often something is it's only suitable for a supermarket or only suitable for a garage. It's not very yes. transferable. Yes. It requires very specialised skills. So people who do it well are great. But the average person don't go near it because a two or three year vacancy is normal and you can't sell it if you can't find a tenant. But if you could find a tenant, you wouldn't need to sell it. It's a real catch-22. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. So are there any other investment classes that you are like it's a no-go zone for you? Well, never. Well, the the key in property is to add value. Yeah, the old thing, the, the worst house in the best street. The key in property is location. A location by itself could add value as the suburb gets better and better and better. You can never add value to an apartment because every year there's new and better ones being built. So apartments are normally terrible. And the worst is a, is a hotel room. Oh. Hotel rooms, worst. But almost as bad as timeshare. The, the, the worst is timeshare. And then there's hotel rooms in, in the worst category. I've seen some Absolutely. of those advertised previously and crunched the numbers. Oh, yeah. And it's also very, it, it's a luck of the draw whether they put someone in your room as well. Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. And often the management charge very high fees, like $15 to change a light bulb or something. Oh, no, stay away from there. Go and stay in a hotel instead. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) I think for most people, people just buy the index. You can buy the index. It's averaged 9% per annum since 1900. For 121 years, you've got your 9%. Normally growth about five and income about four. And it'll keep doing that. And the index can't go broke. It requires no decision on your part. So for the average investor who's not sure what an index is or how to invest in one, how would you recommend they get started? Well, they buy my book and it's all explained in detail in all my books. <laughs> but also, I mean, if that's it. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and bear in mind that the difference between making money made simple now and the one that was published 30 years ago was I discovered in that time that information by itself doesn't work. You need an action plan. So the new Making Money Made Simple combines the information with an action plan. Every chapter's got you must do this, this, and this. It does make a, a huge difference because there is the whole psychology of investing. Yeah, you might know <laughs> you might know what the maths is, but actually doing that action, having the courage yes. to start is, is totally a different thing altogether. Well, you start by writing down where you are now. The best map would be useless if you were lost, if you didn't know where you, where you were. So by writing down where you are, like your house and your loan and your car, your personal loans and your super, that then leads to goal setting. Well, I still owe 400000 on my house. Then I should focus, should I focus on that? I look at my super, I'm only 35. Am I in the most aggressive category? Because that's the best returns. So writing down where you are now sets the trigger for, for all your actions. I think you're, you're so right. It's important to plan. And I know you talk about this in your book as well, but it's so complicated. There are so many complex investment options out there. There's everything blingy from crypto or forex oh, yeah. or... Yeah. It, yeah. It's hard for a lot of young people, particularly, to navigate that and know where to start. 
Well, young people are now driven by influences and social media. I mean, I still like good old property and shares and keeping a nice reserve of cash. I like that. The young ones, oh, well, I know Bill and Bill just made 50 grand on Bitcoin or, you know, something like that. Well, that's what they do. But that's gambling to me. Now, I don't mind gambling if you know it's a gamble. If you put 10 grand in Bitcoin today, you must understand you may lose it all. And that's fine. But don't make that the basis of your wealth. Mm, That's very sound advice. Yeah, and the biggest, I think, thing that people need to know is from The Richest Man in Babylon by George Clayson, a part of all you earn is yours to keep. Now, 90% of people spend more than they earn. How can you build a fortune if if you don't have any capital? It's just basic. Other than your book, that's also another favourite of mine, and it's just such sound, timeless advice, isn't it? I keep it behind me right here. I put it right now. <laughs> right away. You've got like a, one of the older stars, so I can tell you've had it for a long time. Lovely old book. It's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's his basic thing. A part of all you earn is yours to keep. If you don't get to keep anything, how the hell, how the hell can you build <laughs> Well, I find that nearly every time there's a boom, there's kind of this move with people saying, oh, borrow to invest. Now, property is obviously very difficult to get into without other people's money. But, you know, there's this whole move, oh, you just, whether it's the debt recycling or whether it's the margin lending, every time there's a boom, it seems that every second person is like saying to me, what are you doing? You could boost your, you know, um, investment so much faster if you borrow to invest. What's your view on this? I think it's great. There's a product, the NAB Income Builder, I like, where you have to have a third, you must have a third deposit and you must have a 15 year loan, so so you're paying it down. Then you must invest in one of their approved baskets. That's a great product. Or simply just buy the index. You know, you can borrow, I mean, if you had a house worth half a million bucks, I've got no trouble in you borrowing 50 grand for the index because time is the magic ingredient with compounding. So the quicker you get you get the 50 grand, the more the compounding starts. Mm. See, if I put 10 grand in super, just hypothetically, I lose 15% in entry tax, I've got eight and a half working for me. If I borrowed 50 grand, the interest would be like 80 bucks a week or something tiny. But I've got 50 grand working for me. So I've got six times the amount working for me by borrowing 50 instead of making five lots of 8,500. That makes sense? It does. Are there any risks yeah. with this strategy? Do you see a lot of people over-borrowing to follow this? Well, the index can't go broke, but you never want to be in shares unless you have a situation where you're never forced to sell them when the market's having one of its normal bad times. In every 10 years, there'll be four bad years with shares. And it can happen like if you go back to March 23rd last last year, the market fell one day 40%. Mm. Everybody who didn't know panicked and, and they missed out on, on the uptick. There was a whole generation of people who hadn't seen a major downturn since the GFC and just didn't remember any of that. Yes, of course they can. Yeah, yeah, of course. Don't forget, you you can go to my website, go to the Stock Exchange Calculator and enter a notional sum and a notional date, then a notional end, and that will tell you how much you would have had if that matched the All Ordinaries Accumulation Index. So I can look that I bought a property on the beach in 1990 for half a million bucks, which I sold for 867000 four years ago. That same money in the index would be worth $9.7 million. Wow. Yes. Wow. And actually, while we're talking about investment properties and particularly holiday houses, One of the key pieces of advice that I remember from making money made simple was around holiday homes. Yes. And your own personal experience of actually having one as well. Well, you need to, I mean, I've got one now, a house at Sunshine Beach, and and we love it, but that's a lifestyle choice. 
I mean, lifestyle's fine if you know it's lifestyle. I mean, I would have been much better off having that money in shares, but I'd rather have, I mean, I've got plenty of money in shares now, I'd rather have the beach house as well. But that's not an economic decision, it's a lifestyle decision. And, and we don't rent the place, we get, every week we go there, it's my favourite time of the week. But that's lifestyle. Hmm. You know, you wouldn't do that. But as I said in the book, if you've got a beach house, then most people borrow to make the interest tax deductible. You've got to have it available for rent. But your peak rents are, are, are school holidays. So when the kids are holidays, when they're young, you want the beach house. <laughs> And when the kids get to 16, they don't want to know you. I'm only yeah. a few years away from that, but yes. <laughs> well, they're always at stage. When they get to 16, 17, they want to be with their mates. So I want to talk now about another book, which I know has had a key influence on your life, and that is Think and Grow Rich. Yes. And I can turn right behind me next to that one, and there it is. <laughs> How about which that? Which is another favourite of mine. That, that wasn't staged either. They just sit right right next to me. But that's 13 principles. And the first one is desire. Now, if people don't have desire, I can't give it to them. I don't think most people have got desire. They say they have, but not real desire. Mm. You've got it. I've got it. Oh, well, I'll buy a lot of a ticket. I want to be wealthy. That's not desire. That's just a whim. But I call Having a desire, I'll do whatever it takes to get there. That's desire. I'm going to get a house and I'm going to pay it off right. Now, I used to staple the uh, bank statements in the cupboard. Every time I'd go into the pantry, I could see my bank balance. That's where you focus, you see. You've got to really get focused to make it happen. That's a very early visualisation board right there. Absolutely. Of course it is. Of course it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, what you visualise happens once you start the visualise and once you set goals, things happen. It's amazing, you know. The house I'm talking to you now from, I bought 22 years ago. We stood in it 23 years ago because it looks over the, river, over the Brisbane River. And I said, we could never afford that house. But I thought about it and thought about it, came up and we managed to buy it. You know? Wow. Yeah. And that's location. It is the best block in Brisbane. I think. <laughs> Not that you're biased at all. <laughs> well, no, but but I can explain why. It's it's two thirds of an acre on inner city Brisbane with a forty five metre frontage. You just don't get that anymore. Every every room has got a view of the water. It's pretty special. It does sound pretty special. And what about young yeah. people who are trying to get in the housing market? What advice do you have for them? Well. I, okay, I think if we go back a step, I'm often asked, should parents, should parents help their kids? I think in these days, parents should help if they can and if they're good kids. When I wrote Making Money in My Civil back in 87, I said then if the average couple on the average wage bought the average house and used one wage to pay it off, They'd be debt free in five years. Wow. In the new book, it's same thing, but in 10 years, the mortgage is serviceable on one wage. The difference 87, the rates were 13%. Now, now it's 2.5%. Two, two See, back at about 1974 in Brisbane, the average wage was about 15 grand, the average house was 30. So the average nice, low-set brick suburban home was about two years' wages. Well, now here I know that the average wage is about 80, and they're going to cost you 800, so it's 10 times instead of two. Mm. So your house is five times dearer now. And it depends where you live, obviously. Here in Canberra, where I am, property prices are just crazy, and with the global supply chain issue too, it's very hard just to even get the the building materials in to build as well. Well, I'm, I'm trying to do things here. We can't get anything. There's nothing. You can't buy a car at the moment. There's a 12-month wait on almost every car. 
Most people now can sell their car for more than they paid for it. <laughs> it's an extraordinary situation. We are in that same boat too because we bought a second-hand car which was much less than the insurable replaceable value. Yeah. But seeing we like our car and we only have one, we're not selling it yeah. just yet. Yeah. Car's a money bucket. <laughs> I remember when where our kids are now 40, 38, 36, but when they were first one was 17, we bought an old, you know, the old square Volvo. Mm-hmm, I do. <laughs> 10 grand, 10,000 bucks with 150,000 clicks on it. They all learned to drive in that, and we sold it, sold it for $6,000 about eight years later. And that's the perfect car for kids. Mm. And I get very cranky when I see kids at private schools, only if you're turning up in a brand new Mercedes. Because, you know, I think that's very bad. I think it's bad for parents to start buying kids those big flash cars. If you want that, you've got to earn it. Yeah, I understand. If you've got kids who are thrifty and they're savers, you could say, right, for every $1,000 you'll save, I'll give you 5000 There's ways to do it. But to me, you help them now when they need it. Who wants to be 100 uh, and leaving money to their kids when they're 60 and 70? But again, only if they're good kids. And were your kids good kids? Were your kids frugal with good money habits? They're, they're very frugal. No, they're good. They really are. Yeah. Fabulous. Well, I have one final question for you, which is, do you have a frugalist tip to share? You've shared many investing tips throughout this podcast already, but is there something you do that saves you money? Well, there's a couple of things. I believe in what I call the guaranteed secret of wealth. You don't miss what you don't get. I've got an investment property in Brisbane, which my aunt lives in, and she's 92, so she's there. And today's her <laughs> 92nd birthday. Now, we paid 216 for that 13 years ago. Now it's worth 430, so it's doubled in 13 years. It's an old apartment, and we took out a loan of $215,000. Now, I started a Heritage Bank passbook years ago, but all my spare things in there. Like if I, if I got a medical rebate check or I got a tax refund, that passbook has paid off the loan on that building. It now sits at about a five or $6,000 balance. It just grows. Just by taking that. The thing I like now is RAISE, R-A-I-Z. I think RAISE is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Also, I like the 7-Eleven Fuel app. Now, fuel in Brisbane now for a super is $2.10 a litre. It's normally about $1.40. But I've got it locked in at $1.60 because I locked it in a week ago when it, when it was cheaper. So I think the 7-Eleven fuel app, I just love it. <laughs> and the kids love it. I'm at the stage now where I've, money isn't a worry anymore, but I still like to save money. I get a kick out of saving money. It's a challenge. I just love doing it. <laughs> I mean, if you rang me now and a message, I'd probably go into my waste paper bin here and pull out a piece of, pull out a piece of paper out of there and make that <laughs> uh, No, I mean, it's just, it, it's in you, I think. I know some pretty wealthy guys and they don't waste money, believe me. Mm, I could believe that. You play golf with them, they will fight for $5, I can tell you. <laughs> Well, John Singleton was doing a thing with Jerry Jerry Harvey on the on the on the Magic Millions. He said Jerry was an hour late for a major meeting, driving around Sydney trying to find the cheapest petrol. You know, <laughs> old habits die hard. Uh, this is a really interesting thing because some of this sort of law of attraction, the literature suggests that think big, think expansively, visualize that car, buy the car. But then at the same time, most very genuinely wealthy people, such as yourself and such as some of the examples of people that you've given, are inherently yeah. frugal. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, really the fact is that the best joy comes, comes from what you give. All right, I've got a Tesla. I love having a Tesla. But after you've had it a couple of years, it's just it's a car. I just heard this thing the other day. This bloke said, "Oh, I work in the car wash, and they come in in the in the Lambos and the Ferraris. They don't know that people are admiring the car; they're not admiring them." <laughs> <laughs> That's a key distinction. Yeah. So my my focus now. I, I, I mean, I'm 81 years of age now. My focus is giving back. I get more joy from giving back than anything. Mm-hmm. 
honestly. And I, I'm not trying to big note myself, but I just love giving stuff, you know. And we have a budget. We give X dollars every year away. Yeah, always. And I can see that just from how you use your time as well. Oh, I love it. But but, but, but our criteria is, is it's like the apple seeds. I mean, any donations we make have to be going down the line. And I'm very happy to give. There's a charity I like that gives school books to the kids of domestic violence people because give the kids the school books and they can learn. If you can take a kid out of that, there's something is doing something. That sounds just wonderful. So thank you, Noel, so much for being my guest. I've learned so much and I didn't think I could learn so much more in such a short podcast. And like I said earlier to you, I'm a little bit starstruck with speaking to you. It's a huge thing for me to go from the teenager reading your book and knowing that you're such a celebrity to actually having you as a guest on my podcast. And I am just deeply grateful for you sharing your wisdom today. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Serena. Thank you. You've been listening to The Joyful Frugalista with Serena Bird. She actually likes everybody. And, of course, sound has been by Neil Hadley. I'm